It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, Speaker. My, my question is for the Premier. As, as I continue to review this Conservative government's budget, I'm left with very serious questions. Does this budget make rent affordable for renters? No. no. Does it make groceries cheaper? No. no. Does it effectively address the unethical backlog in our court system? No. no. To the Premier, this budget wasn't made for the people of Ontario, so who exactly does this out-of-touch budget serve? No. And to apply, Parliamentary Assistant to the Minister of Finance and Member for Oakville. Thank you very much. Thank you, Speaker. And I guess uh, I'm not sure if the member opposite actually read the budget and has read what people are saying about Budget 2024, because what you're saying is a complete opposite of what we're hearing and what the people of Ontario are saying. Right. It, this is a budget that puts the people of Ontario first. People of Ontario, like the rest of the world, continue to face economic challenges. Costs are up, people are struggling, and at this point in time, at this juncture, we could either slow down or we could continue to build. Build an economy, build infrastructure, build housing, build health care, put money back in the pockets of the people of Ontario. This is a budget that's getting it done for the province of Ontario. Good answer. Supplementary question, back to the member for Waterloo. Speaker, bragging about doubling down on failed policies <clears throat> is definitely not leadership. Uh, and I know who this budget is not made for. I know who this budget was not made for. This budget wasn't made for post-secondary students or educators. This budget wasn't made for teachers or nurses or 1.7 million renters. Funding in this budget is not going towards making life more affordable. It won't improve wages for workers. It won't keep post-secondary institutions afloat. It won't make $10 a day childcare a reality for so many struggling families in this province. And since this budget was not made for the struggling Ontarians, Premier, tell us which corporations and private companies are set to benefit from this government's budget. That's your priority. Remind the members to make their comments to the chair. Member for Oakville. And again, the member opposite is way off base. This is a budget that is focused focus on affordability for the people of Ontario. This is a government that is getting it done for the people of Ontario. We have the great Associate Minister of Transportation bringing in the One Fair Program. $1,600 savings for commuters across the GTA, whether they're in Oakville, in York Region, in Burlington, wherever they are. That is an enormous savings for people that are traveling. And many of the staff who work at Queen's Park actually take those that transit. They're going to save a lot of money. You go and tell them that you don't support that. We've also indexed ODSP to inflation. We've had the largest increase in the history of Ontario. We're helping 100,000 additional seniors through the GAINS program. We've Response. cut the renewal fees for license stickers and license plates. And of course, we are lowering the gas tax here in Ontario, which is going to help everybody. Final Speaker, I wouldn't be uh, bragging about legislated poverty in no. Ontario. I, I certainly wouldn't be uh, doing that. And I do want to say this government says that uh, this budget is fiscally responsible. In reality, the government projected a $200 million surplus and instead delivered a $10 billion deficit. They have slashed post-secondary education uh, by $425 million, while almost half of Ontario's universities are running deficits. The justice system is broken in Ontario. Just ask Kate and Emily. And there is no mention of legal aid anywhere in this budget. Speaker, to the Premier, what will it take for this Conservative government to listen to the people of Ontario and fund the services that they rely on? Members, please take their seat. Member for Oakville. 
Thank you, Speaker. And again, I would like to highlight some of the initiatives the government of Ontario is taking in Budget 2024 because perhaps the member didn't read it, uh, read it in her notes. We are continuing to build Ontario. We're doing it in a fiscally responsible way. We have a path Order. to balance, unlike every other government pretty much in, the, in, the, in Canada and the federal government. We are investing $1 billion in municipal housing funding infrastructure. Municipalities ask for this. We are delivering. We are quadrupling the Housing Enabling Water Systems Fund. Of course, as I mentioned, we are extending the gas tax cut. Go ask the residents in your riding if they are against that tax Order. savings. And we're also adding an additional $100 million to the Skills Development Fund so we can continue to build Ontario. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Kiewetanong. Uh, miigwech, uh, speaker. Uh, speaker, last month uh, in northwestern Ontario, the Snabaski Nation declared a health state of emergency. There continues to be unnecessary suffering and needless deaths across Kiewetanong. Speaker, uh, what page in the 2024 budget addresses this crisis? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak about some of the investments that we have been able to make in Northern Ontario. Um, you know, we're investing more in Northern Ontario health than any other previous government. Our plan is investing in infrastructure, in boosting health and human resources, and adding educational supports for the future. We have, of course, expanded the Northern Ontario School of Medicine, an additional over 100 seats available, and 60 percent of those, of course, are set aside for primary care, the family docs that we so desperately need across Ontario, and particularly acutely in Northern Ontario. We'll continue to make those investments because we know when people have access to primary care multidisciplinary teams in their communities, it makes an impact and it ensures that people have the care they need closer to home. Here, here. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary question. Speaker, uh, the answer does not uh, uh, answer the, uh, the question about the health crisis. But, uh, Speaker, uh, hospitals across northwestern Ontario are struggling to retain surgeons. Patients in Sulaco will be sent further away from home for surgeries that they need. Again, Speaker, uh, what page in the 2024 budget addresses the crisis? Mr. Health. Speaker, specifically as it relates to this week's budget, which was an incredible endorsement of the investments that we have already made and will continue to make, we have um, specifically to Indigenous and Northern communities supports of $94 million over the next three years. What does that actually translate to? That's maintaining mental health and addiction services. That's ongoing additional uh, Indigenous First Nations public health programs. That's early detection for foot complications like diabetes. We are making the investment, Speaker. I hope the member opposite will continue to advocate, but I also hope that they will acknowledge the investments that we are making in Northern Ontario and across Ontario. Thank you. The final supplementary. Um, good speaker, uh, uh, speaker, in northwestern Ontario, Highway 17 was closed this morning between Dryden and Kenora. Yesterday, it was closed between Ignace and Thunder Bay. Speaker, what page in the 2024 budget address highway standards in the north? The Associate Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, Road safety is a paramount focus for this government, and with this transportation minister. The, the final supplementary was unrelated to the first and first question in the supplementary, and they have to be, they have to flow, and they have to be related. No, I, I think we have to, to move forward. The next question. <clears throat> the next question. Order. The member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. 
The courts have confirmed that the Ford government owes the public answers about why they skipped an environmental assessment for the mega spa plant at Ontario Place. The judge said the matter was of significant public law interest, despite government lawyers arguing the challenge should be thrown out. My question to the Premier is, will you halt all redevelopment activities on the Thermos site and conduct an environmental assessment? Parliamentary Assistant and Member for Brampton West. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this particular matter is before the court, so it would be inappropriate for me to comment on this at this time. But, Mr. Speaker, let me remind this House and the public that it was the previous Liberal government, always supported by NDP, that left this historic place, Ontario place, in state of neglect and disrepair. Mr. Speaker, what this government is doing, we're bringing back Ontario place uh, back to, uh, 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 on map and will uh, bring it a remarkable world-class destination for families to enjoy. And Mr. Speaker, a new, a brand new amphitheater, wellness center, a water park facility, and a brand new science center, Mr. Speaker. Not only there, that it will create thousands of new jobs and will attract four to six million visitors annually, Mr. Speaker. We are bringing Ontario Place and Science Center Response. that people of Ontario will be proud of, proud of, and we will bring it back on the world map. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, I really have to disagree with the member opposite. This government is not bringing back Ontario Place. They're giving it away in a 95-year lease to a private for-profit spa company. And in order to do that, they passed Bill 154, which gave the ministers and government officials the power, or attempted to give them the power, to commit acts of misfeasance, misrepresentation, breach of trust, and bad faith with immunity. So my question is, what is in this dirty deal with Therma that Ontario Place for All is having to take this government to court to make them obey Ontario's laws? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if the opposition were ever to form a government and actually function effectively, they would understand how this process works. Mr. Speaker, because the process was competitive and fair as it should be. But you know what, Mr. Speaker, I highly doubt that opposition will ever be able to form a government with this kind of approach, which is anti-infrastructure, which is anti-building, which is anti-making life affordable for the people Order. of this province. Mr. Speaker, the legacy of opposition is leaving our historic places like Ontario Place and Science Centre in state of neglect and disrepair, Mr. Speaker, voting against transit, voting against hospitals, opposing highways like Highway 413 and Bradford Bypass. Mr. Speaker, the legacy of this Premier and this government is to bring back our iconic destination back to life, making it a remarkable world-class destination for people of all of world. Members will please take their seats. Order. Order. The House will come to order. Order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Markham Unionville. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. The carbon tax does nothing, does nothing, does nothing to reduce emissions. It only punishes the hard-working people of the province. While the opposition NDP and the independence liberals continue to support this harmful tax and vote against measures that provide Ontarians with affordable and reliable energy. Our government is taking action and getting it done for the people of our province. Last summer, the minister released Powering Ontario's Growth and outlined our plan to continue building our province's clean energy advantage. I know that there are major projects and procurements that are already underway. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House how our government is providing Question. Ontarians with clean energy as we fight against the disastrous carbon tax. Minister of Energy. 
uh, to the member from Markham for that great question this morning. We are powering Ontario's growth at the Ministry of Energy, Mr. Speaker. And last summer, I unveiled our plan named Powering Ontario's Growth, which is investing in more emissions-free, baseload, reliable nuclear power at places like Bruce Power and at Pickering and at Darlington, small modular reactors that are going into the ground right now as we speak in Darlington, Mr. Speaker, the largest procurement for energy storage in Canada's history. New non-emitting generation is part of competitive procurements, Mr. Speaker. But one thing that I couldn't help but notice this morning was that the queen of the carbon tax, Bonnie Crombie, was down in the media studio having a press conference that was really like a Saturday Night Live skit, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> uh, actually, it was more like a Seinfeld episode. It was a press conference about nothing. Um, but here I am answering question number 273 in this House Response. about the carbon tax, something that 80 per cent of Canadians are opposed to, but these Liberals and the federal Liberals are going to increase the carbon tax Order. by a whopping 23 per cent on my Order. A supplementary question. Member for thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. It is sad to see both the NDP and the Liberal who are yelling in this home, in this house, demonstrate no willingness to support initiatives that provide Ontarians affordable and clean energy. The reality is that they don't have a plan to improve affordability and the cost of living in Ontario. All they care about is pushing their agenda, raising our taxes. Speaker, life is already expensive for the hardworking people of our province. They need more support and more financial relief from our government, not more punitive tax hikes. That's why a federal government must scrap the carbon tax, Question. and they must do, is do it as soon as possible. Speaker. Can the minister please explain what our government is doing to protect Ontarians from the costly carbon tax? Response, Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, the member from Markham is right. We're not raising the carbon tax. As a matter of fact, in our budget delivered on Tuesday, we're eliminating taxes, we're eliminating fees. But the members of the Liberal caucus, you know, there's some smart people over there, but I just can't understand how they don't realize Order. that what is happening on Monday, Easter Monday, April Fool's Day, carbon tax day in Ontario, is that their counterparts, Justin Trudeau and the Liberals, supported by the queen of the carbon tax, Bonnie Crombie, are going to be increasing the carbon tax on Canadian Canadians by a whopping 23 per cent on Monday, Order. Mr. Speaker. 80 per cent of Canadians are opposed to an increase in the carbon tax because they understand what it's going to mean for the prices at the pumps Order. and at the grocery stores and on their home heating bills, Mr. Speaker. The member from Ottawa South and the queen of the carbon tax have to understand Response. that this is a losing proposition. We're driving the cost of living down in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, making life more affordable. They should the next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Housing. The Conservatives have until Order. tomorrow to submit a better affordable housing action plan or miss out on $357 million in federal funding. Now, the Minister likes to say this is unfair, but the facts speak for themselves. I see the member for Ottawa South down there, and I see the Minister of Energy down there. You've had your opportunity to answer the question. Thank you very much. Now it's time to be quiet so that we can hear the, the next question. I apologize to the member for University of Rosedale. Start the clock. You can affairs and housing. The Conservatives have until tomorrow to submit a better affordable housing action plan or miss out on $357 million in federal funding. Now, the minister likes to say this is unfair, but the facts speak for themselves. This government is on track to build just 8 per cent of the homes they said they would build by 2025. My question is this. Is this government going to submit a better affordable housing action plan tomorrow, or Ontarians, are they going to miss out? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. 
clear, uh, Ontario has hit 60 percent of the target. It is, of course, a 10-year target. We are entering year six. The federal government changed the, uh, the goalposts on this one and decided that the 60 percent is actually 28 percent. Uh, speaker, we've also hit 170 percent of our rehabilitation renovation uh, uh, progress, Mr. Speaker. As the member knows, as the member knows, we housing uh, of this type is done through our service managers uh, and our municipal partners. Our municipal partners have also written to the federal government to come firmly on side with our position that not only are we meeting our targets, that not only can we meet our targets over the next four and a half years, Mr. Speaker, but we have exceeded our targets in other areas. So I would ask the member opposite if she Response. would, instead of standing with the federal Liberals who are going to reduce funding by $357 million, if she'll stand with us and with 444 municipalities across the province who are saying they've met their targets and won. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. Minister, municipalities, housing providers in Ontario want this government to stop playing the blame game and start taking action. Ontario has the worst housing crisis and homelessness crisis we've had in decades. It has never been more expensive to rent or buy a home. Even your own budget says that. My question is this. Is this government going to fix up and resubmit a credible, affordable housing action plan, or are we all going to miss out? Members will take their seats. Minister of Affairs and Housing. And just to add a little more colour to this, Mr. Speaker, the money that the Liberals, supported by the NDP, are not transferring to us is $357 million of the approved plan, Mr. Speaker. This is of the approved plan. So we did a plan. The federal government ap uh, approved that plan. We have paid for Order. the plan. We have done what we said in the plan, and the federal government has decided that they're no longer going to live up to their end of the bargain. This isn't about future money. This Order. is about money that has already been approved, committed, under a plan that they approved, Mr. Speaker. That is the difference. What the member is suggesting that we do is go back in time, change a plan that was approved by this House, that was approved by the federal government, that Response. we have paid for, and we are asking the federal government to live up to the commitment that they made to the people of the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. The plan going forward will meet our targets. She should stand with us and with 444 municipalities who want to. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Natural Resources oh. and Forestry. The federal carbon tax is making everything more expensive yeah. for everyone in this province. Shame. People in my riding of Newmarket Aurora and across Ontario are paying more for groceries, for services and for fuel since the implementation of this disastrous tax. No. To make matters worse, the federal Liberals are increasing costs at the pump from about 14.31 cents per litre to about 37.43 cents per litre in 2030. Speaker, no, no. this is punishing drivers across the province, especially in rural areas where they rely more heavily on their vehicles. No one should have to choose between filling up their gas tanks or filling up their pantries. Speaker, can the minister please tell this House how our government is supporting Ontario's rural communities through this challenging time? Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Oh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Newmarket Aurora for the question. She's a great, great member. Listen, uh, we know that this carbon tax is about to go up a staggering 23% on April 1st, and that's just next week, just a few days away. And we know the provincial Liberals support this hike. The Ontario Liberals, ruled by the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie, refused to call on the federal Liberals to get rid of the punitive carbon tax. In fact, if, bon if Bonnie Crombie's the Queen, that makes 
the independent liberals, the princes and the princesses of the carbon tax. We've got carbon tax nobility in our midst, Mr. Speaker. Order. For the great communities in rural Ontario, don't worry. Our government is saying yes to rural Ontario, keeping energy costs down. We're cutting the gas tax, investing in northern Ontario through our biomass program. Response? $60 million going to strengthen the forestry sector and create jobs in the north. Speaker, our government will continue to build and support rural communities across Ontario. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. The previous Liberal government neglected rural communities for 15 years, Shame. and their disrespect for rural Ontarians continues in this day. Individuals and families are greatly concerned about what the future will hold as the federal government continues to impose further tax hikes. It is impossible to understand how the federal Liberals and their provincial counterparts are content to pass additional costs onto people who are already stretching their incomes. Speaker, the carbon tax effects are widespread, including nev negative impacts to industries Question. in the natural resources sector. Speaker, can the minister please explain why our province is better off without the federal carbon tax? Here, here. Good. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you again, Speaker, and again, thanks to the member for the question. Listen, it's clear from the carbon tax that the Liberals across the way, they just don't want anything to be built in Ontario. And it just shocks me how completely out of touch the members opposite are to think that a 23 per cent increase in the carbon tax is acceptable and a way to build Ontario. But no surprise. No surprise, Mr. Speaker, that the Liberals and the NDP aren't listening to the people. I mean, why expect them to start now? The people have been talking about the carbon tax for years, and the members opposite have done absolutely nothing about it. But we're doing something about it. We're extending the removal of the gas tax, 14 cents on every litre, ensuring that resources can move across Ontario to get houses, roads, transit lines built for Ontarians. We're building the province at a rate the queen of the carbon tax, Bonnie Crombie, and her Liberals could never imagine. And Mr. Speaker, we'll Response. continue to do that, continue to support Ontarians in the building of this great province every step of the way, despite the carbon tax. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Today, we are joined by two courageous women, Emily Agar and Kate Alexander. Both of them experienced horrific gender-based violence, the police investigated, evidence was collected, charges were laid, and they took their accused to court, only to have their cases then thrown out due to unconstitutional delay, Speaker. Kate frequently contacted the courts to remind them of the looming deadline and asked for a hearing date, only for her case to be then scheduled 18 months eight, after 18 months of the Jordan deadline had passed. When she pointed this out, they said that nothing could be done. Violent abusers and rapists walk free in our communities today. The government's underfunding of the court system has led to that. Will the Premier commit today in front of Kate and Emily and their families to fund the courts, to clear the backlogs so survivors can have their actual day in court? Please take their seats. The Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, and I don't have the luxury of being able to address individual cases, so I, I will talk in broader terms. We are doing everything we can, Mr. Speaker. Order. We're investing in the courts. I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, the opposition tells the stories, but we're taking the action. We have hired over 340 individuals in the court system, be it Crown prosecutors, victim witness uh, assistants, uh, court employees, court staff, bail vetters. Mr. Speaker, it is incredible Order. the amount of resources this government is putting into the system to deal with the lack of progress that happened under the Liberals previous to us. Now, Mr. Speaker, here's the real challenge. Will the member opposite, in front of these individuals, stand up and tell them that they will support the budget that says we're investing $6 million 
over three years for the children at risk exploitation, four and a half over three years for the victim quick response team, Order. two and a half million over three years to increase the outreach to children and youth, Mr. Speaker, 27 million over three years to enhance sexual assault and domestic violence services, Mr. Speaker, and six and a half million over three years to support. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, it's clear that this government says that they're sticking to their plan with their budget, but their plan is actually failing survivors like Emily and Kate. This government released its budget only two days ago. Court backlogs, bail, and pretrial detention was never mentioned, not once. Emily's rape trial began, but it could not finish because the timeline ran out. Yesterday, Emily tells me that her legal and court part of her story is now over. She's now fighting for all survivors after her so that they can have a chance to have their day in court. How many other survivors, how many, have to come forward to tell their painful stories again and again before this Premier in government is willing to admit that they've let them down, that the courts are in shambles, and they refuse to do anything about it? Take their seats. Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, and that's more indignation without action, Mr. Speaker. I didn't hear a yes to supporting this budget, Mr. Order. Speaker. We are supporting all parts of the system. Now, we recently put $18.7 million to 400 gender based Order. service providers. You voted against it. Yep. We put an additional Order. money to emergency shelters, the to counseling, 24 hour services. You did nothing. You voted against it. Indignation does not pay the bills. We are Order. supporting the victims in this system, Mr. Speaker. We're adding resources, we're adding capital, we're adding the staff and the people that need to make the system run. It was left to shame by Hamilton the previous West Liberal Dan government, Dundas supported by the NDP, and now they vote against every single improvement to Order. protect the vulnerable in our society, Mr. Speaker. Order. The next question, the member for Kanata Carleton. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, last year, from April to October, 441,000 hectares of forest burned in Ontario. We all remember the orange skies, the unbreathable air, and the community evacuations of last summer, which is why it's such a disappointment to see that climate change is ignored in this do-nothing budget. Do you know what this budget has done to firefighting? Since 2022, $100 million of funding has been slashed. Quebec, Quebec's hiring more firefighters. Alberta has declared their fire, fire, wildfire season open in February. Ontario, we cut $100 million from the firefighting budget. Question for the Premier. Nero played the fiddle while Rome burned around him. What instrument will the Premier choose? To respond, Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, what astounds me is we're talking about the budget in this House, and the member opposite can't even accurately read the budget, can't tell the difference between budgeted amount and actuals. Mr. Speaker, here's the story. In 2018, the budget was $69.8 million. In 2024, it's $135 million. And that's just to start. We bring more resources to bear than every, any government in the history of this province to fight forest fires, continually making investments to improve the situation in this province for communities, for infrastructure, for individuals. And we will continue to do that. I'll take absolutely no lessons from the member opposite on how to either A, read a budget, or B, how to fight forest fires in Ontario. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The insults won't change my mind, but I'll tell you what I'll give the minister. I will give the minister a chance. A lack of snow this winter, dry spring, it spells disaster for our wildfire season. Ontario has historically hired 800 firefighters. 
This year, we're projected to hire 440. That's half of our firefighting teams. The government's fully aware of this crisis. They commissioned a $100,000 third-party audit on firefighter retention, and then they didn't publish it. They know what it'll take to fix the problem, but they want to hide it because they're not doing what needs to be done. Speaker, will the Premier commit to publishing this final report of that audit? Thank you. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Mr. Speaker, and Mr. Speaker, I'm sure the member is absolutely thrilled to know and to hear again that we have invested in our fire rangers here in Ontario with a $5,000 recruitment and retention bonus for both staff to come and staff that are already with us. In fact, all throughout AFFES, we are making sure that people are recognized in 2024 for the incredible work that they do. And, Speaker, we've also made other investments, $20.5 million to improve how we fight wildland forest fires, investing in new aerial fire suppression technologies, investing in science and risk assessment, including into collaborative research with universities, building capacity to support Indigenous wildland fire management. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals can ignore what we've done all we want, but I'll tell you, we are right up on top of it for the people of Ontario, and that's what counts. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Transportation. The carbon tax is punishing the hardworking people of Ontario. Residents in my riding of Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke tell me every day that this regressive tax is adding further strain to their household budgets. It's raising the price of everything from groceries and services to the cost of fuel. And with next week's 23 per cent hike, drivers across the province will be paying even more at the pumps. The dire effects of the carbon tax are felt by our trucking industry which serves a critical role in transporting the goods that we need in our daily lives. Speaker, can the minister explain the impact of the federal carbon tax on Ontario's trucking industry? Great question. Great question. The Associate Minister of Transportation. Thank you to the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke for that question, Mr. Speaker. Truck drivers are the backbone in keeping our economy moving, Mr. Speaker. My uncle is a truck driver. I know truck drivers navigate the long, quiet roads throughout the night to deliver the goods that we often take for granted each morning, Mr. Speaker. It is very clear. By the increase of carbon tax, the federal Liberal government does not support the hard-working truck drivers, Mr. Speaker. The carbon tax increases the cost of diesel. Every kilometer costs truck drivers more, not just in fuel, Mr. Speaker, but the precious moments they spend away from their family cost more than ever, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. The truck drivers are not asking for a free ride, but asking for a fair one, where their road to commitment to our economy is not answered with a penalty, Mr. Speaker. Response. Under the leadership of Premier Ford, this government and this transportation minister has always stood with truck drivers, and together we will fight carbon tax. Here, here. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his response. It is clear that the federal carbon tax is affecting the everyday lives of truckers across Ontario. Up until this point, the federal government has increased the carbon tax on fuel not once, not twice but five times. Shame. Speaker, to make matters even worse, they plan on increasing it another seven times no. by 2030. Wow. The opposition NDP and independent Liberals continue to ignore the harmful effects the carbon tax is having on our industries. Rather than standing up for their constituents, they are choosing to support the federal government's unjust tax. Our government will continue to advocate for Ontarians and call for the elimination of this tax once and for all. Speaker, can the minister please further explain the lasting impact that this punitive, punitive tax will have on Ontario's truckers? The Associate Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke is right. The number one issue people facing is unaffordable crisis, Mr. Speaker. The life of the cost of living 
is rising and the federal liberals supported by Ontario liberals and NDP fail to understand the increase in the carbon tax has a significant impact on the budget of every household in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. The carbon tax is in fact an unwanted guest at the table of every single hardworking Canadians, Mr. Speaker. Imagine a single mother juggling multiple jobs struggling to pay for groceries because of the carbon tax increases the expenses. Mr. Speaker, think about a small business owner trying to keep their doors open, or truck driver who's trying to get the goods moved across the province, or a farmer who tried to feed our nation, Mr. Speaker. We must push back against this tax hike on April 1st, which is increasing 23 percentage, Mr. Speaker. Our government under the lease of Premier Ford, we will always fight for the hardworking Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Toronto St. Paul's. Thank you, Speaker. To the Premier, over 400 Art Gallery of Ontario workers are on strike, and many of these cultural workers are artists themselves. They're here today. These are the people who welcome us into the AJO. They set up, they dismount art installations, they hang the art. They provide educational enrichment through tours. They helped raise funds for the AJO's new building. They clean the gallery, but are struggling to pay rent and buy food. And because of their hard work, the AGO has become a world-class destination. And yet this government hasn't increased the AGO's budget in over 10 years. My question is to the Premier. Will this Conservative government properly fund arts institutions so their deficits aren't being balanced on the backs of the least paid workers? Will the Premier show them the Monet? Members will take their seats. Mr. Cook. Tourism, culture, and sport. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. With respect to what the AG Go is going through right now, with re regarding negotiations and ending into agreements, uh, we will leave that up to the leadership of the AGO. And I'm hopeful, as many are, that the AGO and OPSU will reach a negotiated agreement very soon. With respect to their the work and the impact they make in this community, in our province, and frankly across the country, is is at a level that most people don't understand. Their impact on tourism and the opportunities that they create and the great job that they do, not only within and outside the AGO, is outstanding. We thank them for their work, and that's why I remain optimistic that a, a deal will be agreed relatively soon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well done, Minister. Supplementary question. Speaker, back to the Premier. Over 60 per cent of AGO workers are precarious part-time workers, and they're kept that way. They are contract. They can't make enough hours to meet the full-time threshold because they told me yesterday that the AGO puts up roadblocks. All this while the AGO contracts out and while AGO execs have recently received salary bonuses of up to 59.6 per cent, while there's, quote, no more money for wages. We've got the AGO CEO making over $400,000 a year with bonuses of 250 k annually. My question is back to the Premier. Question. Does this government think this is fair? How are they prepared to work with the AGO and get the employer to the table to help these workers get what they deserve? Fair wages, full-time opportunities, protection against contracting out, and livable hours of work. Thank you. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, uh, I won't repeat what I just said because of the importance of the AGO and the workers there that we see when we go over every day and the great work that they do. I did mention at the outset on the previous question that they're in the midst of negotiations. I believe they've been to the, I believe they've been to the table. I'm not sure if, Mr. Speaker, this means I'm not sure what's going on, but I will leave it into the hands of the experts and those that run the AGO and the and OPSU to come to an, an agreement Order. that will help the workers and those people get back to where they want to be. The AGO is an important part of what we do in our community. It drives tourism, in spite of what is often talked about in this, in this legislature, which makes me really quite sad at times, Mr. Speaker, when we don't look at tourism as a driving force of this economy. I'm confident that a deal will be reached, and I'm positive order. it will be good for both the AGO and the workers. Here, here. Thank you, Mr. Toronto Speaker. St. Paul's come to order. The next question, the member for Don Valley North. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Finance. Speaker, I hear from my constituents 
who feel stressed and frustrated with the rising cost of living in my riding of Don Valley North, which is echoed throughout Ontario. Speaker, from families with children to young individuals to seniors, people in Ontario are feeling the pains at home, at grocery stores and gas stations. Speaker, with the looming federal carbon tax hike, these expenses are only expected to soar. With so many people struggling with mixed ends meat, they are undoubtedly looking for relief. Speaker, can the minister please tell this House what this government is doing to protect the people of Ontario and to do combat the rising cost of living? Thank you, Speaker. The Parliamentary Assistant Minister of Finance, Member for Oldsville. Yeah, thank you to uh, the member opposite. I really appreciate that question because you did bring up some points about the rising cost of living in Ontario. Ontario is not an island and immune to the global inflation and rising costs we're seeing around the world. But the government of Ontario, Speaker, is taking action. We're taking action right now in this budget. The Ontario government is currently lowering the cost of gas with the, cutting the gas tax and extending it for till December 2024. This is something that I heard the Minister of Energy just say, Bonnie Crombie and the Liberals and the carbon tax queen would not be doing it. In fact, on April 1st, Speaker, it is a day, it's not only April Fool's Day, it's a day carbon tax is gonna go up, penalizing truckers, workers, commuters across Ontario. We're taking action to make life more affordable for residents across the Spons. province in your riding. Thank you, Speaker. Question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, the Parliamentary Assistant, for his response. My follow-up question is also to the Minister of Finance. Speaker, Ontarians are experiencing economic challenges due to the current high cost of living, and yet the federal government is adding more burdens that will cost an average Ontario families $1,674 in taxes starting next Monday. Speaker, the 2024 budget has been presented already on Tuesday. Can the minister further elaborate to highlight how this government is helping Ontarians weather these difficult times as it continues to work to bring about more economic stability, op optimism and prosperity? Thank you. Member for Oakville. <clears throat> Thank you, Speaker, and I'm glad there's at least one or two independents over there that are against the carbon tax and the rising costs in the province of Ontario. So, thank you for your advocacy working for the people in your ridings, because the carbon tax is the most punitive tax the Government of Canada Order. is putting on the people of Ontario. Speaker, it's hurting everybody in Ontario. Truckers, commuters, drivers, families, everything. Order. Groceries are going up. The government of Ontario is committed Order. to making life more affordable, and we're going to stand, as we've continued to, to fight the federal carbon tax. I just hope the other independents might take a lesson from that independent and stand with Ever us against the carbon tax. Order. The next question. The member for Markham, Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Small Business. The federal carbon tax is disproportionately affecting small businesses in our province. It is a hindering investment, expansion, and job creation. To make the matters worse, entrepreneur in my riding of Markham, Thornhill, tell me that federal government promise rebate are simply not offsetting increasing cost. Mr. Speaker, unlike Order. the opposition, our government has always known that the carbon tax only serves the punished hardworking entrepreneurs. That is why we have spoken out against the harmful tax from the day one. I know the Associate Minister has been busy meeting with small business owners across the province and listening Question. to their concern. Mr. Speaker, could the Associate Minister tell us what the response has been to the carbon tax? Thank you, sir. 
the Associate Minister of Small Business. Thank you, Speaker, and to the member for Markham Thornhill for raising such an important question and his hard work for his yeah. constituent speaker. I've heard a resounding response regarding the impact of the carbon tax. Yeah. Business owners have expressed their frustrations with the increased costs associated with the tax, yeah. emphasizing how it affects their day-to-day -day operations and overall competitiveness. They're saying it's unfair, Speaker, that they pay the most they get the least. In fact, they're still waiting on the dedicated 10 per cent of carbon tax revenues that small businesses and Indigenous groups were promised. John. Speaker, the Liberals across the floor would like Ontario businesses to believe that they're better off without the $1.3 billion that they're owed. Speaker, the Liberals and the NDP need a reality check, but unlike them, we won't stop calling on Ottawa to do what's right for our small businesses, pay them back, and strive. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you to the Associate Minister for the great response. Our government will always support the small businesses in Ontario that contribute significantly to our economy. Speaker, general contractors, trade people, suppliers, and site prep companies all have a critical role in building our province. Sadly, the carbon tax has been a nightmare for the industry. It is driving up the cost on the material and the fuel they need to create more housing. Speaker, this is ridiculous. Absolutely. The federal government must cut the carbon tax so that small businesses can continue to do their important work and build Ontario. So, Speaker, can the associate minister tell the House what impact the carbon tax has on small businesses in the construction industry. Thank you so much. Thank you. The Associate Minister of Small Business. Well, thank you, Speaker, and again to the very hardworking <laughs> member from Mark Markham Thornhill. I also hear the serious concerns expressed by small businesses in the construction industry regarding the impact of the carbon tax. The business owners who are in charge of building homes in this province and getting shovels in the ground while creating job opportunities say that thanks to the federal carbon tax, they're paying more for the gas they need to get to the site and to move their materials. Small businesses like Grouper Construction in Durham are saying, and I quote, this heavy tax will be on the backs of hardworking Canadians and our clients in residential and civil sectors." End quote. That extra cost could mean a business must lay someone off to balance the books or change and charge more Response. to build homes, further driving up prices. Speaker, the carbon tax is detrimental to every business in every sector. We will stand up for all Ontarians. Scrap the tax. Now. Thank you. The next question, the member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas. This government has broken a promise to the people of Milton to stop a gravel pit. Speech, speaker, we know that 70% of people in southern Ontario live near gravel pits. These pits can cause groundwater contamination, air pollution issues, and impacts on endangered species. These gravel pits need proper oversight. But the Auditor General reported that the province does not properly inspect gravel mining pits and inspection rates have decreased by 64 per cent under this government's watch. We need urgent action to hire gravel pit inspectors, but this was nowhere in the budget. We have people here in the gallery from Milton and Premier. They want to know why did you break your promise? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. The member is referring uh, to a project that has been inactive since 2008, and I will uh, uh, echo the sentiments of the Premier and the government, which is protecting human health and environment is our top priority. Uh, we heard concerns from the community about the Reed Road Reservoir Quarry, particularly when it comes to groundwater protection and the need for additional consultation, assessment and oversight for the project. That is why we have required the Reed Road Reservoir Quarry to be subject to a project-specific environmental assessment process under the Environment Assessment Act. The regulation provides an additional opportunity for potential impacts to the environment to be assessed, including local groundwater, to further uh, to make sure we have further consultations to ensure concerns are addressed. 
The proponent has commenced its project Response. specific environmental assessment. And, Speaker, there's more to say, and I will continue my supplemental. Supplementary question. Very much, Speaker. I, you know, this government is famous for streamlining environmental assessments. So let's hope that you actually, you know, do a proper environmental assessment, because the premier and his ex MPP for Milton Palmgill promised that they would stop the quarry. In fact, the premier told the people of Milton, "I am not in favour of the Campbellville quarry." According to the AG's report, the ministry has already approved extraction of 13 times more aggregate than is actually removed each year. And so, therefore, according to the AG, no more pits or quarries are needed. People are rightfully concerned. Is the Premier going to keep his promise to stop once and for all the proposed Campbellville quarry in Milton? Keep his promise, yes or no? Members will take their seats. This is the Environment Conservation. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, and as I will continue with my answer, um, the member may be aware the proponent has commenced this project specific environmental assessment process and has begun consulting with government agencies, Indigenous communities, and the public in preparation for this environmental assessment. I encourage the public to participate in the ongoing environmental assessment process and to share their concerns directly with the proponent. Once the assessment is complete and submitted, the ministry and the ministry will undertake a review and there will be opportunities for the public to submit comments to the ministry prior to a final decision being made. But, Speaker, a final decision has not been made. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Brantford, Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Solicitor General. Since the implementation of this disastrous carbon tax, Ontarians are paying more for everything, from their grocery bills to fuel costs. With another hike being imposed next week, people in my riding of Brant for Brant are concerned about the impact of this regressive tax on public safety. Speaker, firefighters play a critical role in safeguarding our communities. There are few more noble jobs and few more selfless people than those who put their lives on the line to keep us safe. And that's why, Speaker, I am so proud to serve as a volunteer firefighter at Station 7 St. George in the County of Brant. And to my colleagues, thank you for always having my back. But we know that increased costs of fuel and procurement directly affect the essential services that ensure our safety and well-being. The federal Liberals need to scrap this tax today. Speaker, Question. and the Solicitor General, please explain to the House the effect that carbon tax is having on firefighting in the province of Ontario. Thank you. The Solicitor General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to congratulate the member for being a volunteer firefighter and for everyone that stands up to be a volunteer firefighter in the province of Ontario. And the member's right. Every time, Mr. Speaker, you fuel up a fire truck, 300 litres is an average fire truck. An aerial truck is even more. A pumper, they're more. Mr. Speaker, they know when they go to the gas pumps, it's $60 or more. Each fill-up is just. It's just for the carbon tax. Wow. And Mr. Speaker, when you add it up, it's over $8,000 a year just for the carbon tax portion of fueling that truck. And it's not fair, Mr. Speaker. It's not fair anywhere in Ontario. And there's no confusion with our government. But the independent Liberals, in their alternate reality show, thinks it's great, yeah. and it's not. It's not too late. Pick up the phone, call Justin Trudeau and his cabinet, Response. and say this is affecting our firefighters, and cancel that tax. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Solicitor General for his response. It's good to hear that our government holds public safety as its highest priority and is standing up to the unfair carbon tax. Unlike the opposition NDP and the independent Liberals, our government recognizes that this tax is punishing hard-working Ontarians. Speaker, people in my riding are worried about how the carbon tax is placing a strain on our public safety system. All Ontarians deserve to live safely in their communities, and they are counting on our frontline first responders to ensure their security and well-being. Speaker, even if the NDP and the Liberals won't, 
We must always stand with our public safety heroes. Speaker, can the Solicitor General further elaborate on the importance of cancelling the carbon tax for the firefighters of the province of Ontario? Thank you. The Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, just the other day, we had the head of the Ontario Association of Fire Chiefs right here. We had the president of the Ontario Professional Firefighters Association right here. And they know our government will always stand with our firefighters morning, noon, and night. But, Mr. Speaker, whether you're fighting fires, and all we ask for them is they come home safe at the end of the day, or for those police officers, come home safe at the end of the day as well. The carbon tax on every vehicle that is used for public safety is, adding, is an added cost that could be used to buy more bunker gear, buy more technology to fight auto theft. Do, do something that we can have a tangible, lasting benefit. The carbon tax costs us on public Response. safety. It's not fair. It's not too late. Bonnie Crombie should do the right thing. Call her friend Justin Trudeau because she has the number and can't. Thank you. Next question, the number four, Hamilton Long. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. The Greater Hamilton Health Network laid out a pre-budget submission, a detailed plan endorsed and supported by over 67 stakeholders. Their ask was $20 million, but the government allocated only $2.2 million this week, just a tenth of the proposal. The proposal, if fully funded, would see over 55,000 residents in Hamilton and the surrounding areas correct, connected with a family doctor. Team-based, patient-centered, medical care and support at high school uh, who are at risk in our communities. Premier, what is the reason this funding is not in the budget this year? Deputy Premier, Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Well, in fact, I think the member opposite should know that we have invested in primary care multidisciplinary teams. Of course, in February, we announced 78 new expanded satellite opportunities. 78, Speaker. Imagine what that does to the people who want to have primary care multidisciplinary teams in their community. And clearly, our expression of interest that we issued last year was very uh, was dealt with a lot of excitement because people want to have that opportunity. Communities want to have the opportunity. That's why I was particularly thankful that in today, in uh, this week's budget, we have announced another expansion of that primary care multidisciplinary te team approach. It means that if you need to see a family doc, you'll see that family doc. If you need to see a nurse practitioner, you will see that Response. nurse practitioner. If you need to see a dietitian, a mental health worker, you will have that opportunity. It is exactly what clinicians across Ontario want, and it is exactly what we are providing as a province with our new investment of $356,000 million. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Number four, a tenth Mark. of the funding is not going to cut it. No. Our health care teams are stretched to the brink, and our constituents are struggling to find and access the care they need for their health issues. Ontario health teams like GHN have the solutions. They do the work. They just need the funding. Their comprehensive proposal would see the equivalent of nearly 170 full-time additional health care providers, from nurses to social workers and more. Their plan would have included administrative support so physicians could spend time with their patients, as the NDP have proposed. Now they are left with just one-tenth of their need. Premier, I ask you again, is this the funding that communities like Hamilton can count on in this budget? Minister of Health. Of course, primary care expansion is just one investment that we have made with our budget. You know, I, I have to say, you also need to train these clinicians and the expansion that we are seeing in Brampton with the new medical school, in Scarborough with the new medical school, and of course Tuesday the announcement that was lauded across Ontario, the York Medical School, that will focus on primary care practitioners. Those are the investments that are going to make an impact in our communities. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning.